Hi, everybody. It's Plastic EP here from Melbourne, Australia. And coming in is John McIndoe, your favourite. The world loves John McIndoe, famous boogaloo. <laughs> How are you today, John? <laughs> All right, mate. Doing well. Doing well. <laughs> you know, I'm a first-generation fan. I'm not going to tell you my age. No, go on, go on. The Boogaloos were huge in Australia and the rest of the world, just huge. Wow. Yeah, Seriously. We, and we it, still it, love it, you. It was over so fast for us. We just didn't know. You know, it was like, that was it. Done the gig, on to something else, you know. Trip. Yeah. I've got to ask you, you were one of the tallest Boogaloos. You were the tallest guy. Right. <laughs> yeah, I was five, eight and a bit, five, nine. Now, little John was a couple of couple down. <laughs> now, listen, you were a good friend of Davy Jones before the yeah. monkey. Tell me all about that. Yeah, from there. Well, when I moved to London in the old days, I actually worked in publishing. I worked with Brian Somerville, who was a Beatles publicist, with my good friend Alan McDougall. Alan actually got me the job, and that led me on to actually working a little bit at Apple with George Harrison and, and Terry Doran and Peter and the whole gang at that era. We were in Baker Street then before they moved to Savile Row. So I hung out with them and I bumped into Davey a few times before that, you know, we just went to the local pubs and clubs. Everybody did in London, you know, and we just became good pals, you know, when we went over to the States. He came and visited us. Yeah, yeah Miss Old Davey was a nice kid, nice guy. But you knew him before he was a monkey. Yeah, yeah, Coronation Street. <laughs> yeah, Gee, that's he, young, isn't he? How old was he then? I was, I was about 17. Okay. So I don't know what age he was. Yeah. What about Peter Noon? Did you know Peter Noon? Oh, I met him one, one time. But, but funny enough, after the bug, Bugaloos, I went back to London, done a hundred things, and I came back to America, and I actually worked with a guy called Robert Littman. And he was a, like a producer, talent agent. So I worked with him, and actually he's the man that produced The Man Who Fell to Earth with David Bowie and The Deer Hunter stuff like that and um to get back on that when i worked there with robert like we i'm trying to think i'm terrible with dates uh it's been real hot here today i've been pulling weeds and like <laughs> <laughs> what was the question again? <laughs> i missed that question again doesn't matter. If you missed it, you missed it. But let me tell you this. Yeah. Let's talk about some famous celebrities. Now, mm -hmm. this is the story as I know it. You were working for Apple and then you, you got told they got an audition for a TV show like The Monkeys. Oh, okay. I can bring you there. Is that true? Yeah. What happened was I was working with Terry Doran. And what happened was, well, actually, I was with Brian and Alan McDougall over at Brian Somerville's and they said, you know, Go over there to Baker Street. Terry, Terry's over there. Meet Terry, and he'll um, get you because he wanted me to do something else. I I worked in, in a publisher's, and what I was doing, I was a fax machine, a text machine. You know, in them days they only had telex, so I'd do all the running around and things. You know, for the and they said, "Yeah, you're wasting your talent. Get over there." So Terry Doran. My friend, who Terry was with all the Beatles, George and Bingo, John, he was their main, he was the fifth Beatle, the real fifth Beatle. So what we done was um, we were putting a band together up at Apple. And I actually slept upstairs. They let me stay in the building at night because I, I left my other place and I was out of a place for a few days, a week, whatever. So I went up there and my friend Peter Beckett, from band player, baby, come back, Peter. We were putting the band together at Apple, and it's so weird. So 
you know, working on the band, you know, guys going to clubs, checking out a good bass player, a good drummer, and just kind of going back and forth doing that. And then, <laughs> and then, and then when, I'm trying to get my facts right from them years. Oh, that's right. Then we went back to um, uh, Water Street where the Marquee Club was. We had a hotel behind there. We had a little van. We all slept in the van, <laughs> the whole band. That was our hotel. But I had VIP train. I could go up and sleep at Apple upstairs before they, opened, they were open in the boutique then. And just a lot of crazy stuff went on in them days, you know? It was funny, but a long story short. Okay, they, I was doing my stuff in London with the bands, trying this, playing in this band, doing this and that. Playing with all the lads. I mean, everybody that I was involved with in them days, they all became superstars. You know, Steve Marriott, Ronnie Wood, goes on, you know, just goes on. And in them days, we're all just the lads playing the little circuit gigs and checking one another out, you know, who's good for this band and just formulating, I guess. But anyway, so they moved to Savile Row to the new Apple place. And I met Terry and Terry said, John, they're doing an audition for a new monkeys. I went, oh, that's fine, yeah, because I just saw Davey the other night at the pub. <laughs> So doing a audit, I went, oh, okay, I said, all right, give me, you know, I'll go down and get, what do you want, guitar player or singer? I said, I ain't got my guitar with me. I said, take one from the studio. I believe it was George's guitar. <laughs> What's, what uh, guitar was it? Do you remember? It was a big what guitar was? A big Gretsch acoustic. Yeah. And so I took the guitar, popped down to Manchester Square, EMI House, where they were doing the audition. And I guess I was late. It was almost over. They already picked two guys for my part, which was Phil Collins, of all people. <laughs> and, you know what I mean? And they already and they picked, um, oh, what was his name? He was a manager, yeah? And Elton John's manager. Yeah, that's right. I can't remember his name. I bumped him into him a few times after that. Um, it would come to me. <laughs> so... They've already done their little song, so I'm sitting there and they're in the room with me and I pick up the guitar and Marty said, play a song. And I thought, oh, the last thing we were rehearsing, I could remember the chords and that. I said, okay, so I play. And he said, okay, how can we get a hold of you? I said, well, I ain't got a phone at home, but you can call Terry at Doran, you know, Apple, or I'll be around that circuit because I'm semi-working and trying to put a band together. So anyway, that night, right? That night we went to the speakeasy club. <laughs> and I was with my friend Linton Guest from The Love Affair. They had a hit, Everlasting Love. Yeah, that was huge, huge, huge song. song. Yeah, Linton, she was best friend, my best buddy. Anyway, so me and Linton went there and we just went there. It was like a normal thing. We done were hanging out there. Sneak easy, and then at the corner of my there, Sid Croft and Mick Jagger, and one of his girls, and Marty wasn't there. I never saw Marty, and I walked by, hey, you doing right? They said, hi, you know, but by next morning, I get a call. Well, I got it through someone else, of course, and then they didn't have cell phones, and you know, it was <laughs> slower than them days. I get a call. And it's like, can you come back down? They want to audition you again. Oh, okay, so I go there. And I was there 10 minutes, and I guess they were running, cutting things up. They said, you got the job. I'm like, really? That was so strange, because Phil Collins was really good. And I thought, well, why? What? You know, I thought, no, was a lot better than me at the time. <laughs> you know, and I was a bit, but I got the gig. You know, thanks to Mick Jagger. He said, he picked the, he picked the bugger as we said. Thanks, Mick. You're out there, mate. You know I appreciate it. He picked you oh. out of four photographs, didn't he? Pardon? He had four, or four photographs and he picked you. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. We had the final for the guys, yeah. 
John Reed was the other guy. <laughs> John Reed, I don't remember. Small world, funny lad. It was twenty pounds. And then what happens was, how long was it before you went to America to start filming the show? It was a. This is a crazy thing. It was a few weeks before that we went to the to rehearse at Phil Collins' mother's state school. So we were right there rehearsing for the Bubbles, and Phil's in there rehearsing with his band, Genesis. You know? So we are doing, you know, they wanted us to learn our dance or keep time. I wasn't an actor or anything like that. No, I'm just a lad with a guitar trying to make a living. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so we learned all that stuff. Caroline was a pro at it, and so was... She's uh, beautiful. She's 19 years old then, isn't she? She is just a lovely, lovely person. It's a pleasure to work with her, you know? And then um, I guess that was it. Then we hit the road and went to the US of We were only there about a week and Davey came and visited us. He came up to the house and um, a couple other friends of mine from London. And, you know, as we were filming, you know. You yeah. were staying in a mansion. Is that when he came to visit you, Davey? No, oh, yeah. When we were there, it's funny, that mansion, Madonna bought it. <laughs> when we left, she bought the building. We were, you know, it was with a studio rented and that. Yeah, it was in Griffiths Park, Falkenham Drive. Madonna lived. <laughs> and what, from the backyard you could see concerts, is that right? Yeah, you could go to the back window and you could see the Hollywood Bowl. Any concert you want, any night. Because we were right up there, you could see the beautiful shot, 90 degrees, the whole place. Yeah, that was fun. John, what was it like the first time you walked onto the set of Tranquility Forest? That was my What boy. was that like? The color was like blinding. <laughs> was like, Whoa! You know, they've done a beautiful job. It was like a fantasy life. And then, you know, I did it. I did it. Okay, I can fit in here. <laughs> Leave me here. And it's so funny, you know, behind the set was a Star Trek set. They finished doing the last adventure of Star Trek. And at the back, me and little John, when we had a break, we'd go in the back and just kick back in the bridge of the Enterprise. Off we go. You know? <laughs> That's a story and a half. They had a lot of Star Trek gear there, did they? They had a lot of gear in boxes. They did. And it was all like the set was just packed and thrown to the back. And right next door, I Love Lucy show was being recorded. So I'd pop on our break, we'd sit down and watch Lucy perform because she had her stage open. It was live. Lovely. She was a lovely woman. I met her to talk to her a few times. Yeah, it was. Quite, quite a trick, you know. When the like show took off, one. John, Pardon? when the show took off and you had a lot of fans, yeah, they did a lot of you did a lot of promotion work, didn't you? Yeah, we put, yeah, we did. We, we toured all the states, you know, with NBC, you know, promoting the show. We done a we played live at, in New York at the baseball place there. I can't remember what it's called, the famous. Place there. Uh, yeah, and we and we hanged up when we we're in New York, we hanged out at all the clubs. We went to, you know, we stayed at the Sherry Nelligan in you know, on the park and uh, near the park. And I went down the first night we were there, me and Wayne, I think we got, we went down and I saw George Harrison with a couple of his friends in um, Copacabana in New York. So it felt like being back in the little clique again with the lads. The lads. You know. Do you remember all the teen magazines coming to do interviews? Yeah. Um, do you remember yeah. Anne Moses? Anne Moses. Tiger, Tiger Beat. Beat. And um, 16 and all their magazines, yeah. Yeah, they came and done a lot of interviews, yeah. That must have been a buzz. Yeah, she was good friends with with Davey and Moses because I remember. That's right. Yeah. 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 And did you meet any of the other monkeys? Um, only one time when 
I went down to the, he had a shop and he took me to his shop and I think Peter Talk was there. That's Zilch. He had the yeah. shop called Zilch. That's it. And Peter Peter was there, but I never saw Mickey or the other one. You know. What was yeah. it like wearing the wings on the back and hanging <laughs> hanging up in the air? Yeah, that was fun. I dig it. You know, I'm fun. I'm sitting up there, you know. Are you ready? Hang on, 10 more minutes. Oh, all right. Well, let me know so I can straighten up because you're hanging like a sack of meat. You know? <laughs> John, how did yeah. they make you fly? Did they make you lie on boxes? How did they do it in yeah. those days? Well, that was that chroma key. It was brand new then. So you sit on, you lied on a box and they could get an angle and then pump you into the scene. Trippy there. And that was brand new. I think we were one of the first to use it. That was George Stevie. Invented that, I believe. Yeah, yeah, true. And John, can I ask you? Mm -hmm. You obviously went to all the clubs when you weren't filming the Bugaloos. You were going everywhere to the clubs and hanging out and having a great time. Yeah, yeah. Wasn't supposed to, but you know, I'm one of the lads. Got to hang out. <laughs> you know. Yeah, John and a lot of people. A lot of things were going on then. You know. Yeah. John, can you imagine an episode? I got my friends Charles Rosenay on the text. He said, pity there wasn't a bugaloos in Star Trek episode because you're in the yeah. same studio. That's funny, yeah. Yeah. Beat me up, Scotty. <laughs> <laughs> now you got it. But i got to say, that guitar that you played and the outfit that you had, it really stands out. And it really does. Look. I can't show you there, but you're there. You got the guitar right. to the side. It's, oh, okay. It's solid. It was a solid piece of um, plexiglass, or what you call it. resin. It was heavy. <laughs> you could play it, but not really play it. You could tune it and play it, but it wasn't really an instrument. It was a prop. Yeah. You know when you did the album, they released the album. It's called yeah. Bugaloos, isn't it? How long did it take to record that? We just we keep going in after we finish filming. We had most of it pre-recorded, so we didn't have the fun of well, me and John, the drummer, we were the musician. We were kind of not privy to that. We wanted everything done on time, on schedule. As soon as you finish it, I'd get in there and do this, do these harmonies, do that, and get out. <laughs> you know, they were very regimented. It wasn't like kick back and let's get creative here. It was all pre-set for us to do and we just filled the gaps, you know? Now, I want to ask you, with Sid and Marty Croft, I want to ask you a question. Yeah. Did they ever refer to the monkeys? Did they ever tell you, you guys are going to be like the new monkeys? Did they ever say anything about the monkeys TV show? Yeah, they did, but not like that. They said, you know, this is a show like the monkeys were taking that path, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so because you know what I'm saying, that yeah. you, you're nothing like the monkeys, but no, we you're after the monkeys. So what I'm trying to say is, would you say the monkeys were an influence on the TV show? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, we weren't really. And we were sucking up, you know, the monkeys were out in the real world. We were in our little forest. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know what I mean? I love we were, it. We were Sparky's shopping. great, isn't he? Sparky's great. Oh, Billy, great guy. Lovely guy, dying man. Yeah, sad. Do you He's know which episode guy. I like the best? When you guys say, Come here, Sparky, we want you to sing on a song. That's yeah. magic. Yeah, yeah. That's timeless. Oh, now, did no, they no, ever no, say no, to you, no. right? <laughs> did they ever say to you, want to do a concert tour of the Bugaloos, like do all of America? Wow, that'd be fun. Yeah, I think make for plans that. for that. Yeah, you know. They were going to do all that, and it just stopped. It was I found out after it was political. They didn't, our show was cancelled after seventeen episodes, and I heard from the horse's mouth that the guy who was running NBC at the time got booted out. Someone else come in, so they like to be creative, so they can everything that that guy brings in. It's normal. Now they canned our show, and then within months. 
they would saturate Capitol Records. I have like four big mail bags of fans. NBC was getting a ton. They wanted the show to go back on the air. But at that time, we were sent back to UK, which is, I'm glad we did, because we've done a lot of good stuff there. And then it, we never, we were always, like Caroline explained, we were sitting, waiting, waiting, waiting. But then we found out the Crofts like to do one show, another one, next one, next one, next one. Next one. Wasn't, you didn't really, you could have followed up on a lot of their shows. You didn't. On to the next one. But you guys were keen to do a second series, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we were. We were getting all, you know, we were just get. we were good. We got into it. Everybody liked what, everybody was enjoying themselves doing it, you know. Do you think if you guys stayed in America and didn't go back to Britain, do yeah. you think maybe then there may have been a chance to have had a second series? If you said, no, we're not going home, we're staying? No, we would have came back. We would have went. You know, we all kept in touch for a while and we fiddled, fizzled out. But me and little John, when it got too long, me and little John started putting a band together with Tommy James's company and the Shondells, Rolex yeah. Records. We put a band together with really good talent. It was me, Little John, Charlie Harrison. Charlie played with Rod Stewart, the bass, and he played with Poco. He was, was a good friend. Me, Charlie, um, Ru Russ, and I can't remember the guy. But we were doing, we had two good songs and we were recording them. Then we got, I, I don't know what. We, oh, they were looking for a single, so they wanted a single, get a single. So we're all banging our brains, writing songs, and we never really found a single that they wanted. They wanted this more teeny bopper thing, but really, Charlie was, my friend Charlie was a real good, good, good writer, good player. And me too, I wanted to do something a wee bit more. I had a taste of the teeny bopper. Well, it kind of scarred me a little, because a lot of my cool friends were, you know, well, Teeny Bopper, you know, you know, me, not really. Give me a break, you know. <laughs> but you know, John, what I want to say is you're a true musician, you yeah. are a true musician yeah. before the Bugaloos and after the Bugaloos and during the Bugaloos. Yeah, yep, yeah. yeah. I'm still uh, playing, diddling around. I played with some pretty trippy people, but I've kept it low key and wrote songs with. Like Buddy Miles and a lot of people in the past that I work with a few good songs here and there, but I just like a low key life. I just keep a little low key. I yeah, work I understand. A lot of big projects, movies, a lot of things. I'll keep low key because I like my lifestyle. I like being able to just go out and have fun and do what I want. No one recognizes you. When I was one of my friends that got famous, we go out. It's so uncomfortable. You really can't have fun. You can't just enjoy yourself. And can I ask like, you? Can I ask you now about a few celebrities? Okay. For example, did you meet Jimi Hendrix and he goes, "Hey, John, how's the bugger lose?" Did anyone say that to you? We saw Jimi Hendrix in London walking by. He was going to the Chelsea drugstore and he had a couple of girls with him. And me, at that time, I was with my friend. We were just going down to Chelsea for a reason. And he walked right into the store by me. But I knew, you know, Noel and them earlier in the band. And actually my old girlfriend started dating me. Um, no. <laughs> so it was, you know, a big circle of friends. And even the Doors, when the Doors came, we hung out with the Doors. Well, I hung out with Robbie. I liked him, he was cool. And uh, Jim Morrison, he was, we were out of it at the time. Yeah. Hung out with some of the best. Tell me life. this. The mm -hmm. band is like, I'm just saying some names, big names. Mm -hmm. Did the did you come across the Beach Boys, the Mamas and the Papas? Did yeah. you the Turtles? Who yeah. did you meet? I met Brian from the Beach Boys. Yep. He invited us down to this place in Venice. And he had a little studio in there. And we hung out for a few days on and off when, when I was up there with the Bugs. And, um, oh, yeah, I met Mama Cass. And I think of all the people that, actually, everybody that was active, that area kind of ran around, bumped into them. Melanie, 
wanting to um um linda rice said we went up to her house when she was living with the band in the canyon and stone ponies yeah in the canyon and uh, crosby still and nash well i know graham nash because when they they had a ma they had a management company called the red bus in denmark street and we were right next door, me and, me and Alan McDougall and Brian Somerville, that was our office. So I'd seen him all the time, the Hollies going in when Graham's with the Hollies. You know, I see Graham, yeah. You've had an unbelievable rock and roll lifestyle, haven't you? Yeah, but it's so funny, it was like a little melting pot in the 60s, late 60s, early 70s, 60s, I see 65 to 70. A lot was going on, and it was all happening in a little circle. They all rehearsed at the same places or hung out somewhere else. They all went to the same pubs and clubs. They all tried, you know, the roundhouse, the, the marquee, and all the little local gigs we do. And, uh, and I just saw a lot of bands blossom and become what they are from there, you know. What about the Rolling Stones and the Yardbirds? Did you know them? Well, I... I knew Rod, see my, at one time I was managed by Billy Gaff and Billy managed Rod Stewart and a lot of bands and we were going to do a band called English Rose when I got back from the Bugaloos and before I decided to hook up with John and try and we, you, you're always experimenting, you know, and like a, the band we put together for Billy Gaff was me, Linton, Jimmy, Russ and Steve Holly. Steve joined. See all the guys into bread. Steve joined Wings. Yeah, that's right. And he played on a couple of Wings albums. Went on tour a couple of times. So everybody was in and out doing things. The band for a little while and off. Oh, I got a gig. I got a gig. You know. Did you that's know Denny Lane? I met him. I don't know him. I met him a few times. He would see Ter my friend Terry Doran. I'd hang out at Apple a lot because me and Terry were good friends. I'd even go to George's house when he lived in Isha, hang out with George Harrison. Nice guy, George. He was the best Beatle. And then I'd go, I'd go and hang out with, um, well, uh, Steve, Steve Marriott, my friend Steve, because I knew him yeah, in the early days. Small faces. Yeah, but he was doing that super group then with, what was he called? Um, he put a super group together. Yeah, that's the one. Is that with Frampton in it? Peter Frampton was in it? Yeah, yeah. Whatever it was called. Yeah, Humble Pie. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Humble good, good. Pie. well done. <laughs> and it's so funny when he go down and try to sing. So he said, Come on, we might front guy. We might have him because he all sound good. I went, uh, I'm working with my friend Charlie and that. I'm trying to get something going. You know, we're all in, uh, active. And all the people I knew in them days all well, became superstars. From Rod Stewart onwards, all the lads all became superstars. Yeah? And that was cool. I mean, I was a bugaloo. I'd done my, my share of like, a bit of fun and with audiences and all that, but I just got the bug to work behind the scene after working for Robert Lippmann and saw how you package a movie. You, we were putting movies together. We worked on the last movie betty davis did she died before it was finished the wicked stepmother <laughs> so i got into the movie tv production for a while i've done done puppet production shows for uh, you know like the public broadcasting and a couple of specials i produced so i got into that but kept a low key with it i don't like the glamour i'm a don't know if me you know I exactly like now john I want yeah. to ask you about the Boogaloo car. When did you get the Boogaloo car? That was George Barris made that. And, you know, he's the guy done the monkey's car. Yeah. So, and uh, many others. And Dean knew, Jeffries designed it. Right. And I knew, like, a lot of people in that business because I. this is a crazy thing. Before I took the path to rock and roll, I nearly became a race driver. I knew Jackie Stewart. And I used to go English and Scotland and race a Ford Cortina GT. <laughs> then I progressed to a Ford, 
a lot of Cortina. Then I got a lot of land, and I had the bugs to be a race car driver. I even moved to to um, to to Cheltenham for Lotus to work with Lotus. And it's so funny. I, I kept. It's like life is strange. Um, in my mind, I'm set. Then I meet my friend Linton again. Come on, John, stay with us for a while. We're going to do this. And I got pulled in, in the music biz again. So I, I've, I've been bouncing in and out of everything for years. <laughs> but you know what? Yeah. Mm. When you hit the bugaloos, I'm just saying, that was a chance of a lifetime. That was like the stepping stone to other things. It really was, yeah. It taught me a lot about that side of the business, yeah. I actually worked for Sid and Marty. When we finished the bugaloos, I worked at their factory for a year. And I had to leave because my mom died. So I... I worked there and we worked on projects for Disney and oh, a lot of big, big projects. And for Las Vegas, I believe we, we were working on the, the Racco Well Show in Las Vegas and um, just a lot of big stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm just going to ask you, is there one thing you can tell me about the bugaloos yep. that happened that no one knows about? You've never told a story about a bugaloo story. Can you tell me something that you've never told anybody on this show? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The first day we were filming, right, they were doing the close-ups for the characters. Well, I wasn't too hip to television and all. I, I was waiting for, like, you ready? Go. <laughs> get the old guitar, get going. And they wanted just headshots. And the camera kept zooming in on me, and I didn't know what. Director wasn't very clear that he just wanted a headshot. So he's doing it three or four times, but I'm waiting because we're all together and I'm waiting for some, another cue. And the guy said to me, If I have to do this again, you're, you're replaceable, you're fired, you're getting out, of it. we're going to send you home. What's he talking about? I said to the other one, What's he talking about? Oh, they want a shot for your head. So I just did so. Yeah, in green, and that was it. That satisfied him. That and that remember, you remember that, right? Huh? You remember what? that story? Yeah, yeah, I remember that because that was like, what, what were we doing? Here? You know, it was funny because everything was not. It was all done in little sections in different places. When we went into the tranquility forest, the, the little set. The rest was all done in blue screen or here, there, whatever, you know? So, you know, to make it look bigger than it was. You know. Yeah, big fun. I want to ask you, what is your favorite, over your career, what's your favorite guitar? The best guitar you ever had? Oh, Telecaster. I love a Telecaster. Fender Tele, 50s, 60s, one. Yeah, I've had a lot, of, you know, I've had Fender Acoustics and Gibsons. But the telecasts are like so simple to play, and you can doctor it any way you want these days, you know, to get any sound you want. Now, now you know, know, it's the 50th anniversary of the Bugaloos this year. You know, it's I the know, 50th yeah. anniversary. I know. Wow, 50 years. What? <laughs> now, listen, if you have to say anything to your fans, say something to your fans before we go. Say something to the world so they can remember what do you want to tell them about the bugaloos? Well, you know what? It made a lot of people happy. And I saw when we went on tour and we saw the, the faces. We had a young crowd. And they're so magical. And I love that. I, so it was worthwhile to give them, you know, that little bit of enjoyment. And my own family, we're circus people. My mother was a circus. My grandfather was a clown. So I come from the circus. So I left the circus to get into <laughs> to rock and roll. You know, people leave home to join the circus. Well, I left the circus to, get, to be a race car driver, and I finished up in rock and roll and television. <laughs> you know, all I want to say is, John, yep. we love you, and the world loves you, and the Bugaloos live on forever, and you're in pop culture. You're yeah. always going to be there, John, always. You, Every yeah. day. Every day people are discovering the Bugaloos, new generations of fans. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I just want to tell you sincerely, the world loves you, John. Thank you. Well, I love them too. 
So you need to say it, John. Tell that. Bye bye. Love bye you, bye. man. Love you, bro. <laughs>